Hello and welcome to British Society of Criminology's Green Criminology Research Network Twitter conference and to my paper on the dog delusion. In his book The God Delusion, Dawkins aims to shatter what he claims is the delusion amongst those with religious beliefs. He exposes these delusions not simply to point out the fallacies and false beliefs held by those in religion, but because he argues these beliefs result in pervasive harms to people. It is not that a belief in a god cannot do good, but it often perpetuates and hides pervasive and serious harms, both intentional and unintentional. Upon reflecting on four research projects I've conducted over the past 13 years on the use and abuse of dogs, Dawkins' arguments have resonated with me in terms of the inherent conflicts between human beliefs and engagements with the non-human animal world. That is, our collective beliefs about caring for animals is shrouded in contradictions, fallacies and falsehoods exemplified by our use and abuse of said animals. This event focuses on green criminology in a changing world, and you may, may believe that for animals we are living in kinder times, whereby an increased number of regulations encompass a broad range of constraints and obligations in the human-non-human -human animal relationship and where animal abuse studies have slowly moved from the periphery of criminology to being tackled in key research journals and conferences. And yet we live in an era of unprecedented scale and severity of animal abuse through industrialised farming practices and the international trades in animals. And people are largely complicit in these harms. Although few actively choose to engage in them, um, they often do, as many uses and abuses are normalised and entrenched into our cultural and relig religious practices and are facilitated by neoliberalism and speciesism. It is indeed a changing world for non-human animals. In the UK, we often refer to ourselves and are referred by others as a nation of animal lovers. And this is certainly evident in our desire for companion animals, support also for animal NGOs and for animal welfare policies. And of course, the outcry amongst the public to certain types of animal cruelty. A similar image is portrayed by many other countries in the Western world. This belief, I argue, is based on an emotional connection we feel to animals rather than the truth of our actions. In suggesting there is a falsehood in our beliefs, what delusions do I refer to? Overall, the belief that we can use and abuse animals as we do and still avoid unnecessary suffering. And linked to this, the belief that we give due regard and care to non-human animals that we love and care for those animals that we bring into our home. And as the UK Minister of State for the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Lord Goldsmith, recently and passionately stated, there is no place for animal cruelty in this country. In spite of such statements and the evident care that many people have for animals, especially those closest to us, if we take a critical eye to how we systematically engage with animals, it becomes evident that we bring them prolific and pervasive misery and death. We pick and choose, often without scientific basis, those animals who deserve our protection and our wrath. We tend not to view animals as individuals or treat them like victims of crime. We find it difficult to define the harms they experience as crimes, needing unequivocal proof and absolute certainty of their suffering before we are willing to act. We purposefully breed animals for aesthetics and productiveness rather than health, assuring that we will suffer pain throughout their lives. Many of these harms are unintentional, but that does not make them right or consistent with our beliefs in how we are treating animals. Our reactions to animals and their welfare is often based on emotions rather than science and evidence. Take, for example, the difficulty UK campaigners had in getting animal um, sentience, which has been documented for decades in science, recognised in law post after article or the relevant article in the Lisbon Treaty was not supported in the UK withdrawal bill. Consider also our engagement with animal harm and abuse in criminology. Despite animal abuse and many other uses of animals being outlawed or controlled, non-human animals have largely been omitted in research and are seldom mentioned in criminology degrees. That is, unless they are specifically related to crimes against humans. And even on that note, why do we fail to seriously consider animals when we can identify so many crossovers between animal abuse and serious crimes and harms, such as organised crime, tax evasion, youth gangs, domestic violence, child sexual exploitation, public health risks, climate change, and the list goes on. Critical criminology has been challenging traditional understandings and uncovering false beliefs about crime and criminal justice for decades. 
it is time to direct that gaze fully onto non-human animals. Expelling the illusion of care and revealing the reality of our relationship with animals is of great importance. It is crucial for the growing number of sentient non-human animals who suffer in silence. But it's particularly relevant now also because the development of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 have been linked to our ceaseless exploitation of animals. But also in terms of my studies, there's been a significant rise in companion animal ownership during COVID where people have turned to animals to ease social isolation, mental health. Um, do those who profile their puppies on social media as a new beloved family member, as an inspiration or a life savior, have the slightest notion of what is actually going on in the pet trade from which they purchase their dog? Or do they realize what might happen to their dog if it grows into the wrong shape or size? Or when what they consider the cute features that attracted to them, them to the dog in the first place are in fact deformities and a disability. I doubt it. And if these contradictions are evident for our nearest and dearest, those confer the most protection in law, this should lead us to seriously question our treatment of other less favored non-human animals. Dogs are, in terms of Darwinian principles of intelligence and survival, arguably the most successful mammal on the planet besides ourselves and perhaps cats. Their eyes in society is what anthropologist Hare calls the survival of the friendliest. Dogs and cats are the most popular companion animals in the UK and many other European countries. In 2015, a population of 61 million dogs was estimated across just 12 EU member states. In the UK, there are about 9 million dogs, that is one in every four homes. We require approximately 8 million puppies to annually fill our demand across the EU um, 1.6 million puppies a year to meet UK consumer demand and the trade in dogs represents an, an annual revenue of 1.3 billion euros across the EU while the UK puppy trade was estimated in my research to be worth approximately 130 million pounds and yet we have tens of thousands of abandoned and stray dogs in the UK annually now admittedly this is a reduction from hundreds of thousands 10 years ago but we continue to euthanize healthy but unwanted once companion dogs in their thousands while the production of and trade of puppies grows each year. Findings from four research projects are very briefly discussed here to highlight the paradox of our relationship with animals. First I'll consider the puppy trade based on a study, a study funded by the Scottish Government and DEFRA in 2017 with colleagues uh, Tanya White and Paul Biddle. This involves multi-method or involved multi-method empirical research. Second, I'll discuss the phenomenon of status dogs based on three studies, one conducted in 2008 um, and then two others funded by the RSPCA in 2010 and 2019. These also involved multi-method empirical research amongst a number of experts, stake stakeholders and owners. The dog trade has changed dramatically over the past 10 years. Particularly problematic are the large-scale rural breeding establishments and international commercial breeders, many of which are situated in Eastern Europe. The fact that the trade is now more cost-effective because of numbers and that it's now a profit-driven trade means that the high profits and low risks for illegal breeders and suppliers makes it ever more attractive to, cr to criminals. The fact that the trade is fueled by consumers' desire for young, fashionable, trendy dogs, what we could consider status dogs of a different kind, um, who are willing to pay thousands for puppies bred for as little as £25. Consumer demand outweighs domestic UK supply with legitimate breeders, which means that consumers are looking elsewhere, far and wide, for their puppies. In a lot of cases, they end up going to the largely unregulated online advertisements to try and find and purchase their puppy. There's limited regulation, identification and enforcement of the trade, largely because when these um, were put in place, they were put in place for a trade that was uh, a lot smaller than it is nowadays. Harms to animals have been documented at each point of the trade, from breeding to rearing, transportation, sale and post-trade. To facilitate the demand, bitches are uh, repeatedly and forcibly impregnated and destined to live their often shortened lives in cramped, dirty spaces with limited care and contact with people and other dogs. Puppies are born in appalling conditions, seldom given the treatment or care required for their health or behavioural development. They're removed from their mothers too young, 
transported across hundreds of miles over days to reach the most lucrative marketplaces. Many of these puppies become ill or are bred irresponsibly and must live with long-term health issues. Some, if they are uh, prevented from traveling overseas, have been discarded on the side of the road or abandoned in the port. There are those puppies who are lucky enough to find themselves in loving homes for the rest of their lives, but many will go to homes that may not have a clear uh, understanding sorry, of the commitment required and may inadvertently subject them to inappropriate training, care, and are simply just not prepared to care for them into the future. And when these dogs become problematic, they are often simply abandoned or relinquished, which I will focus on shortly in my next study. This is particularly relevant as evidently many owners have impulsively purchased their dogs online, especially during COVID. As a result, animal rescues can experience, this is, has commonly been seen in the past, patterns of increased relinquishment and abandonment of popular breeds within a few years of, of the height of their popularity. For example, Huskies were linked to the popularity of Game of Thrones. Further, the trade exposes dogs and people, of course, to biosecurity risks, criminals and organised crime groups. Dog owners themselves can become victims in this trade, but it is important to point out that without capricious, impulsive or simply ill-informed buyers, the commercial trade in puppies, especially from illegal sources, would not be profitable. Despite our love of dogs, we should not forget that this is a cruel trade, a trade in sentient animals who have an interest in avoiding suffering and a desire to experience pleasure and exhibit natural behaviours. My next study further highlights the types of harms at the end of the trade in ownership of status dogs. From 2008, the media documented a rise in young people deemed to be from deprived areas um, and often involved in gangs owning and breeding bulldog breeds, including the banned pit bull types. Central to the harms experienced by these dogs is the fact that they are replaceable. Their value is linked to external, often changing factors and trends. In my research, I identify that owners are involved in active and passive abuses, from dog fighting, active cruelty, brutal training practices, to neglect and abandonment. These harms were not simply, as you might imagine, amongst those youth who had dogs for instrumental reasons, but rather many of the young people I spoke to loved and were protective towards their dogs and yet engaged in these harmful behaviours. And while these are important abuses to consider for the purpose of this talk, especially that of abandonment, I'm actually going to draw your attention to the formal responses which systematically harm these dogs. The status dog label is often a death sentence for dogs. Improper training and care and abandonment has resulted in the killing of thousands of these dogs. Under the Dangerous Dogs Act in 1991, four breeds or types of dog, dogs are banned as they are perceived to be too aggressive. Now, it's important to note here that this is not supported by scientific evidence. If identified as one of these four breeds, this legislation required the, the destruction of the dogs despite their behaviour or temperament until 1997. In 1997, dogs with responsible owners could be put on an exemption index. However, what about all those dogs who belong to irresponsible owners, especially the young, identified, delinquent uh, youth out there? They were required to be killed by the state. Um, dogs who were caught up in the criminal justice system were often held for months in kennels, in some cases um, over a year, while they awaited the trial. And I mean they were on trial, despite many being of good nature and never harming a, harming a person, and they were potentially going to lose their lives. In 2015, doggy bail was introduced, again for responsible owners, who could then take their dogs away from the kennels and reduce their time in kennels. Just to give you an idea, um, between 2013 and 16, almost 5,000 Section 1 dogs were seized. The Dangerous Dog Act also created, it is argued by some, the harm of status dogs. Making some dogs illegal made them more attractive to those who intended to use the dogs in their antisocial and criminal acts. The Dangerous Dog Act um, is arguably state-sanctioned violence against thousands of pet dogs solely based on how they look and some unevidenced notion of the potential harm that they might do. In 2019, the study I conducted identified a significant fall in the uh, number of status dog owners, status dogs, 
and in the number of dogs being abandoned. But to get to this point, there were years wherein the abandonment and euthanasia of healthy dogs increased significantly. As the quote here indicates, and the table on the next slide shows. These dogs, in what seems to be in their tens of thousands, were discarded and quietly removed from a society who claims to love their companion animals. And in terms of linking status dogs to the puppy trade, here are the new status dogs um, called American or pocket bullies, identified to me as being bred by organised criminals in the UK to avoid the Dangerous Dog Act. These puppies can earn up to £6,000 each, so a litter of puppies £20,000, which is very easy money. When considering how to respond to the crimes and harms I've outlined, I repeatedly have pointed to the need for strengthening and changing regulations, legislation, detection, enforcement, prosecution and sentencing. And these are clearly important points in terms of reducing the illegal trade and irresponsible dog ownership but they are less likely to remove the systematic routine harms experienced by these non-human animals. In reality, what is needed is a sea change in our beliefs around how animals are used, how well welfare needs are being met, and how well they are being protected. This change may only be possible if we're willing to see through the delusion of care that we've convinced ourselves about. We have to consider what the commodification of these animals is doing. Is it possible to have a lucrative pet trade without compromising welfare? If our dogs continue to be valued as commodities and objects of status, their needs are unlikely to be met and they will continually be exposed to harms from those who are meant to protect them, their owners and the state. Ideally, we want to shift the burden of proof to showing that the trade is not causing harm rather than showing that it is. My studies demonstrate that while we do care for animals, we also have a vested interest in denying their individuality and their victim status. The God delusion makes, for some, a compelling case that our belief in God is not just wrong, but potentially deadly. And I argue our belief in our capacity to deliver animal welfare to our beloved companion animals such as dogs is also not simply wrong, but potentially deadly. The issues highlighted here expose the hypocrisies and paradoxes that enshroud most of our relationships with non-human animals. The hypocrisy is notable in a criminology which focuses on harms and systemic abuses to those most vulnerable in our society, and yet tends to exclude non-human animals. I hope that in highlighting my research and findings that more academics, research funding bodies, government agencies and people in general realise that they can and should question and challenge and also change our uses and abuses of animals. Importantly, I hope, as Dawkins similarly points out in his book, it will prevent criminologists in the future from saying, we did not know that we could. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.